I welcome you all uh, to another research summit in finance, economics, and banking. As you well know, this is a joint organization of the Finance, Economics, and Banking Research Network, a group of 14 universities worldwide and FMA uh, International. And um, this is a collaboration so between um, the FEBREN and uh, FMA International and with universities from Western, Eastern Europe, South America, and Southeast Asia. Uh, if you have a question or comment uh, to our uh, speaker, please use the, the chat uh, Q&A box, which is located below on your, on your screen. I will collect as a moderator the questions throughout the session and put them to our speaker as time allows. However, if I will not be able to put all the questions, they will be shared at the end of the seminar with our speaker, and then uh, you will know what all the questions has been uh, formulated or comments. So it's very much my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Alex Edmonds. Professor Edmonds is a professor of finance at the London Business School. After his PhD in finance from MIT as a Fulbright scholar, he joined Wharton in 2007 and was tenured in 2013, shortly before moving uh, to London Business School. Alex's interests, research interests are in corporate finance, uh, responsible business, and behavioral uh, finance. He is the director of the American Finance Association, vice president elect of the Western Finance Association, fellow of the Academy of Social Science, and as of today's information, is the new vice president, vice president of FMA International. So my, my congratulations. Uh, from 2017 to 2022, he was managing editor of the Review of Finance, the Journal of European Finance Association. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Harvard Business Review, and the World Economic Forum and has been interviewed by Bloomberg, BBC, CNBC, CNN, Fox, Reuters, Sky News, name it. So, so many uh, that uh, interviews. Alex serves as a no executive director of the Investor Forum on the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on the future of responsible investing and here in Denmark and in Oberg on Novo Nordisk's in the Sustainability Advisory Council. Alex's book, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit, was featured in the Financial Times Best Business Books of 2020 and won the Financial Times Award for Excellence in Sustainable Finance Education. His latest book may contain lies, how stories, statistics, and studies exploit our biases and what we can do about it is Amazon's number one category bestseller, both in US and UK, and Financial Times Business Books of the month, last month, April 2024. The book categorizes misinformation in four missteps. A statement is not a fact, a fact is not data, data is not, not evidence, and evidence is not proof. By last, and not less important, Alex has won 25 teaching awards at Wharton and LBS. Without further ado, uh, Professor Edmonds, on behalf of FEBREN, FMA International, and uh, our participants today in the seminar, thank you very much. I know your busy agenda. You told me that is the third seminar already today. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Well, thanks so much, Chazawa. It's really great to be here. And thank you to everybody who's attending, giving up an hour of your time to hear my research. Some great names on the attendees list. Really grateful that you, you are here. Thank you to the FMA. It's great to have uh, this partnership. So this is a completely new paper. So it's not even available on SSRN because it's still embryonic. So it's great for feedback and uh, really excited about presenting it to you. Let me first introduce my co-authors. Um, so many of you will know Dirk Genta at LSE. 
he was one of my advisors back in my MIT days a long time ago. Uh, Tom Gosling is an executive fellow at LBS. He's a also an executive fellow at the European Corporate Governance Institute. He has a PhD himself, although it's in math. And then after being a maths fellow, he worked as a um, executive compensation consultant, was the leader and the head of PwC's practice for, for many, many years. And so this paper is one where we're going to survey investors on sustainable investing. So why do we need to do that? Well, it's not too surprising. I'm sure all of you know that sustainable investing is a huge topic nowadays. So back in 2006, it was niche. 63 investors managing six and a half trillion signed the UNPRI. By 2021, this had grown to 3,400 investors managing 121 trillion, a huge increase. But I've just spread misinformation. I've just um, committed the sin of my latest book because this is something which is quoted a lot. But are these statistics actually that convincing? Well, sustainable investing seems to have become increasingly mainstream, but is signing the UNPRI actually doing sustainable investing? You could sign this and not actually put this into practice. So what might you actually do to figure out whether it has been mainstream? There's a couple of things you can do. One of them is you can study the stocks that they actually hold. And this interesting paper in the Review of Finance finds that it, particularly in the US, signing the UNPRI is not correlated with your actual stockholding. And this recent very nice paper called Green Tilts finds that approximately 6% of investing is sustainable investing by comparing the stocks you hold relative to a benchmark. You can also look at the voting behavior of investors as this recent paper was done. So these are great papers. They use the standard method of archival research where you get some data and you run regression. So this is a great research method. Most people in the audience use this. I do it myself. But even though this teaches a lot, there are some potential limitations. So data only shows you the outcome of an optimization problem. It doesn't show you the underlying objectives and beliefs and constraints which lead to us seeing what we see. For example, if you find that investors are holding more green stocks, why might that be? It could be for a huge range of reasons. Maybe investors are holding these green stocks because they only care about financial return and they believe that these green stocks are un underpriced and so this leads to alpha. Or maybe these green stocks don't matter, but the greenness is correlated with other stuff, which leads to financial returns. Or maybe it's nothing to do with financial returns. Maybe the goal of an investor is to maximize social output or some externality reduction, and that's why they're holding them. Or maybe it's not even a conscious choice. Maybe it's a constraint. Maybe they are managing a fund with an explicit mandate to hold these green stocks. So it's difficult. We can't always look at the data and form conclusions. It could be that that data is consistent with lots of different interpretations. And so this is why we are trying to study this with a survey. And so why does that matter? Because you might say, well, in any field of finance, we don't know what causes the data. Does this mean we need to run a survey in every single subfield? No. But why this might be particularly important in sustainable investing is the following. People point to this earlier statistic and say, look, there's this big growth in sustainable investing. Sustainable investing will make the world a better place. But that requires sufficient asset managers to either care only about financial return, but believe that ES performance is below the value maximizing level, so they'll increase this level, or they put significant weight on environmental social performance. They don't just care about financial outcome. Or there are constraints which force them to do this. And because these are beliefs and objectives and constraints are hard to observe, this is what we want to get to with the survey. And not only do we want to answer this question, but we also want to constrain and guide future theoretical and empirical research. We're stepping into the real world, getting our hands dirty and finding what do practitioners actually believe to hopefully make sure that research in the future is practically relevant. So who do we survey? 
So we managed to get 509 active equity portfolio managers to reply. And so we're really grateful to those of you who responded, some of whom might even need be on this webinar. And so why we're so grateful for this is there's lots of other great surveys out there of investors, but many of them are responded to by stock analysts. Here we have the actual portfolio managers actually making investment decisions rather than analysts which are advising on these decisions. And we think this is really important for the reliability of the survey. We look at active portfolio managers who make discretionary decisions. We also survey globally because there might be different views on environmental and social investment around the world. Now, importantly, we don't just look at sustainable investors. We look at investors in general, both traditional, and sustainable. And many of the times I'm going to contrast my results between them to show how this differs. We have broad global coverage and we have looked ourselves as to whether the results differ across geography. They actually don't matter so much, which was surprising to us because of the culture wars in the US. Most of the differences between the US and outside the US are explained by this traditional sustainable split. So that's why that's the main split I'm going to show. And, and I think, again, as I highlight, what we're looking at is asset managers, not asset owners, and it's portfolio managers, not these other people. Now, before I get to the results, let me show you how we collected the survey information, because the credence you give to our results depends on whether you think we have uh, surveyed in a correct way. Because while I've highlighted some advantages of the survey research method, there's a huge problem potentially with some self-selection and who responds, are they responding in a fair way? So the first thing we do is try to ensure that we are surveying a range of people, not just sustainable investors. Otherwise, we would get the views of people who already believe in sustainability, not the mainstream. So what we do is in the subject line, we don't call this a survey of sustainable investing. Otherwise, there could be immediate bias. If you don't run a sustainable fund, you might just hit delete without reading. So we call this an active sur academic survey of equity portfolio management. We say it's about environmental and social factors, but we say we're equally interested in funds that are not marketed as sustainable, as one without and in funds that do not consider ES factors. Why? Because it might be, even if you're a mainstream fund manager, you might be more willing to reply to the survey if you consider ES factors, so we need to make this really clear. And then what we do is that if you start the survey, we are very clear on what we are looking at. So we are, this is not an ESG survey. This is a survey on just environmental and social performance. Why is ES not ESG? Because nearly everybody believes that governance is important. Governance is internalized. If you are a company with poor governance, you will suffer the consequences. Whereas with environmental and social performance, that, that is where the debate goes. That is often an externality. You affect wider society, but it's not clear whether this is eventually internalized. And so we want to focus on that because that is where there's a lot of controversy. And for the same reason, we highlight that we are about ES performance, not ES risks. So there's two things. There is the impact of a company on wider society. And number two, there's the impact of society on the company. So let's say you're a company, you are a fossil fuel company, you're contributing to climate change, but you might not bear the risk because who suffers from climate change? It could be a real estate company with some beachfront property. Now, Clearly, there are some people who believe that performance ultimately manifests in risks, but there's others who don't. And so we're really clear we're going to focus on ES performance, because again, this is where the debate holds as to financial materiality, where nearly everybody would believe that a risk is something which is financially material. So we're clear here, we're about performance. OK, so let me now get to the responses, but I wanted to spend a good 10 minutes explaining what we're doing because this affects whether you can believe the results. So the first set was on beliefs. Do you believe environmental and social factors are important? So if we ask that, we might just get people saying, yes, it is important. So we start with a ranking question. We want to ask, is this important relative to other things that you might be studying? 
And so what we looked at was strategy and competitive position, operational performance. Why do we have governance in there? It's because ESG is often conflated and brought together. Or we have corporate culture. Why? This is an intangible asset. And sometimes people might say we don't care about ES because it's intangible. And we also have capital structure there. Why? Because people believe that capital structure, well, Medigliani and Miller said, this doesn't matter in the real world. Now, clearly, it doesn't matter in a frictionless market. Now, clearly, in the real world, we don't have frictionless markets, but there is not a lot of convincing evidence that these departures are huge. If you look at, say, the evidence on the trade-off theory, it is not as convincing as you think. So we think this is useful as a benchmark because this should not matter in perfect capital markets. So what we find is striking. To, list, to us, at least, ES performance is right at the bottom. So it's even lower than governance, even though ESG is all banded together often. It's lower than corporate culture, even though that's an intangible and maybe this is a bit fluffy and nebulous to some people. And it's lower than capital structure, even though this is irrelevant in a perfect capital market. And if you look at this, you might think, well, that is of investors in general. But what about when we split them between tra tra traditional and sustainable investors? We actually find the same low rank. And in fact, if you look at these numbers, pretty much all of these numbers are the same, except we see some redistribution. Corporate culture goes down and ES performance goes up, although it's still lost. But to us, at least, it was strange that sustainable investors, not so surprising they were going to re respond to ES performance more highly, but this is at the expense of corporate culture when often these things are being seen interchangeably. And let me pause here. So this is one result which is going to recur throughout our survey, is the difference between traditional investors and sustainable investors is much less, at least compared to my prior and my co-authors prior. And let me step into the academic world now. So often we have models where you have traditional investors that maximize one thing, sustainable investors that maximize another thing, Actually, they're not too different. A lot of their results are quite similar. It's not the case that sustainable investors see this as super important relative to other financial factors. Even though this goes up, it goes up only at the expense of another factor, which is often conflated with ESG. Okay, so that's our first question. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to change this in two ways. We're first going to ask you about ES in absolute terms not relative to everything else, because it could still be that this is important, even though it ranks thick. It could be everything is important. So I don't want people to go away from this and say, hey, new study finds that ES is not important. This is only relative. So we're now going to move to absolute term. And also what we're going to do is we're going to move from looking at the effect on long-term shareholder value to the effect on long-term shareholder return why we want to look at the extent to which investors think it's priced in. So what we're looking at here is, do we think that there's going to be significantly positive alpha, then you give a two, or significantly negative alpha, you give a minus. And so what we find here is interesting is, again, while there is a difference between traditional and sustainable investors, a big chunk of traditional investors, nearly half of them, believe that ES can lead to alpha. And so this I find interesting because even if your goal is only financial return, you only care about maximizing financial returns, many of these people still think ES does matter. It could be mispriced. So some of you might know my article, The End of ESG, which was published in Financial Management about how ESG should not be seen as a niche term, only relevant for ESG people. This is mainstream. If you're a mainstream investor, then you should take this seriously. So on average, people do believe that ES does lead to positive outperformance in terms of shareholder returns. Why? Because it may well be mattering, um, because it might be a misprice. And in contrast, there's little support for the notion that good ES performers are overpriced. Even among the hardcore traditional investors, it's not something that people think is going to be a bummer. So this is the first answer. 
do we think it's going to generate alpha? The question is why. So why might there be outperformance of green companies? And this answer surprised us. So I did not expect this to be the first answer. So it was not that good ES performance improves long-term value and it's underpriced. That's what we thought you'd get. We instead got the answer, good ES performance is correlated with other things that cause long-term outperformance. And this is true even among the sustainable investors. So the card-carrying green investors who love sustainability, why do they believe this drives alpha? Not necessarily because the greenness itself is going to drive alpha, but greenness is correlated with a lot of other stuff. These green companies, they may be well-managed, they may be profitable to begin with. It is these emitted variables which are driving the outperformance. But if you contrast that with some empirical studies on ESG, they will correlate ESG with firm performance, not controlling for lots of stuff, and say, well, this is proof that ESG. So that came out quite strong. But what also comes out is not only this mispricing thing, which I thought would rank much higher, but this idea which was captured in Pastor Stanbar and Taylor's JFE paper, that it's just a demand shift. So if there's increasing demand for green companies that will drive up their prices over time, that is nearly as important, at least for traditional investors, as the idea that ES is just mispriced. And this also highlights that there's a heterogeneity, heterogeneity in theories. There's lots of different views on ESG out there. And importantly, these different views are not just on sustainable versus traditional lines. We often, and we includes me as a modeler, like to think that the main difference is you've got traditional people who think X, sustainable people think Y, but even within the branch of sustainable investors, there's differences in viewpoint. There are some people who run sustainable funds, yet they believe that sustainability leads to underperformance. And also, even among the sustainable funds, some think that ES itself is valuable, Others think it's not valuable, it's just correlated with other stuff. And again, what this points to is that for future models, allow for differences in beliefs. Maybe for future empirical work, we're often quite binary, looking at funds that sign the PRI and signs that funds that don't. Maybe there's lots of other sources of heterogeneity that we could exploit for us, those of us who are empirical research. Now, then we ask the same question for bad ES performance. So before we said, do green companies deliver positive alpha? Now we're answering, do, green com do brown companies deliver negative alpha? And what is interesting here is there's much more symmetry between traditional and sustainable investors. So before there's quite a big difference, but here there's a lot of similarity. And this suggests that for traditional investors, they believe that ES matters much more on the downside than the upside. So remember, only 45% of them thought that green companies deliver positive alpha compared to 73% of sustainable funds. But 61% do believe that bad companies deliver negative alpha. And so this might be a hygiene factor where if you don't achieve a certain level, you're going to be underperforming. And again, this might be interesting because as empirical researchers, we like to measure just ES performance in general. Sometimes you might want to break up good versus bad ES performance. So I have one final thing before I end the belief section, which is, do we believe that companies are over-investing in ES? And why do I ask that? So if I go back to one of my early slides, why does it matter what people believe? Because if we believe that sustainable investing is going to change the world, either it has to be that sustainable investors believe strongly that one of their objectives is social performance, not financial performance or that they only care about financial performance, but they believe that companies are under-investing compared to their value-maximizing level. And so this is what we see here, is that the average numbers are pretty much in the neither camp or sometimes in the over-investing camp. So we don't see systematic belief that companies are under-investing. The mean scores here are slightly positive, so the idea that the investment industry is going to en masse tell companies, hey, you must all do more ES investment is unlikely. 
companies, investors generally think that companies are managing the ES issues well. And this is in contrast to some of the views that the media and policymakers have, which is the investment industry needs to get much more engaged, needs to micromanage these companies and tell them to what to do. In fact, here, what seems to be the case is they believe that they're generally managing these issues well. So let's now go to the object. So we've asked about their beliefs. What do they think about the importance of sustainable investing? What do they think about the likelihood of, of alpha? Here, we're going to ask, what is their goal? And again, why we ask this is that models often think there's one set of investors that only cares about financial returns and another that cares about some social outcomes. But what does the data say? So we ask the following. How much long-term risk-adjusted return would you tolerate a company sacrificing to improve its ES performance? Now, before I get to the answer, let me explain why we asked this question, because you might think it's a bit convoluted. Why didn't we say, how much long-term return would you sacrifice to achieve some ES outcome? But when we asked this in beta testing, we got so many responses that no investor would ever admit to any sacrifice. Why? Because of fiduciary duty. Investors, many of them just felt that they could not even sacrifice one basis point of financial return to achieve some social outcome, even if they were branded a sustainable fund because of fiduciary duty constraints. So we put this in a much weaker phrase. It's not about you voluntarily sacrificing return, but whether you would tolerate a company sacrificing financial returns. So this, we've asked this in a way that's going to allow them to give high answers, and yet despite this, we got big no. So many investors said zero, I would not tolerate any sacrifice, even though we gave them the option of one basis point per year. And so what this suggests is that only a quarter of traditional investors and only 30% of sustainable investors would even tolerate a single basis point of sacrifice. And the very highest level that we had, only 5% of sustainable investors and 2% of traditional investors would allow a sacrifice of 50 basis points per year. And 50 basis points per year, it's pretty much a rounding error. So if you look at studies like the Gormson Huber study on the cost of capital, often companies don't really change their investment decisions when their cost of capital changes. So the idea that investors are able to really change company actions by sacrificing returns to change the cost of capital is not necessarily that realistic when we think about fiduciary duty. And so this always comes in the free tax fields. Why aren't you willing to sacrifice anything? Fiduciary duty. Fiduciary duty? You stupid academic, fiduciary duty, don't you know the real world? Now, nobody said something that strong, but there were statements like that in the real world. Unlike in your academic models, we have to maximize financial return. This is at least the perception of sustainable investors. I understand that there's different interpretations of fiduciary duty, but what's interesting is to get the views of the people who are managing. So, that's what their objective is. It's financial return. But you might think, well, actually, this doesn't mean that sustainable investing is dead, because there could be another way in which you achieve sustainable investing, even if the objective is only financial return. Can we lay on a particular constraint? Can we tell you you're not allowed to invest in, say, the tobacco sector? So this is another way in which sustainable investing can be practiced. And my answers on this are going to be much more positive. So we ask first the following. Have firm-wide ES policies, your fund mandates, your clients' wishes, or concern for your reputation or sustainability rating ever caused you to do any of the following? And so what we found was that 61% of traditional investors and 84% of sustainable investors did things they would not have done otherwise because of constraints. So constraints matter. Constraints are often binding and leading to different decisions. What are these different decisions? So for many investors, these are decisions with negative financial consequences. 
This led to avoiding stocks that you thought would outperform. So that might have been tobacco stocks. Holding stocks you believe you would underperform. So it might be that you were thought you had to buy electric vehicle stocks, even though this was a bubble. So you might think, well, it's not too surprising that constraints lead you to sacrifice financial return. Because isn't that reason, the reason for the constraints to begin with is to get you to think about something other than financial return. So this is why the other set of answers was really interesting to us, is that these constraints actually caused investors to do things that worsen the environmental and social objective. So let me repeat that. Often we believe that these ES policies are there to improve a company's ES performance even though it sacrifices financial performance. But in some cases, not a huge numbers, but at least in a significant minority of cases, this did lead to some actions that actually worsened the ES outcome. For example, it avoided owning ES laggards whose ES performance we could have improved. If you think of one of the main ways in which sustainable investors can make the world better, buy some troubled companies and engage with them. For example, engine number one and Exxon is often used as a case in which you had an investor which bought a brown company and is trying to make it green. Some investors just say, we, we can't do this. Our constraints prevent us from investing in fossil fuel. Similarly, we might have to focus on visible dimensions of ES performance at the expense of more important issues. Maybe we vote focus on demographic diversity of the board rather than true cognitive diversity. And so when we take all of these results together, the fact that the beliefs are that actually there's more important thing than ES. Number two, the objectives are financial value and little departures. And number three, the constraints, sometimes they hinder you from achieving environmental subject, social objectives. That may well explain why there's limited impact of the effectiveness of sustainable investing to change the world. So there's the Burke and Vince Van Binsbergen study finding that the effect on the cost of capital is limited. And even if it wasn't, the effect of the cost of capital on its decisions is small. This paper in the Review of Finance uses a, a nice a causal methodology to find that sudden shocks to environmental and social capital do not have positive outcomes. And the survey papers here look at the evidence more generally and finds that often ES activity, be this stock selection, divestment, and engagement, does not really lead to too many real world outcomes. And so why might this be? It's not that they're bad people. It's not that they're greenwashing. It's not that they're lying. It's that, unfortunately, in many cases, it is that they're constrained perhaps by fiduciary duty, and even sometimes by the very ES constraints, which were supposed to enable them to make all of these changes. And when we ask them, well, which are the ones that matter? It is um, what was surprising to us was firm, wide environmental and social policies came up top. So what this means is that when you're buying a fund, you're not just buying a fund, you're buying into a fund family. And that fund family might have firm, wide policies on things like carbon emissions or fossil fuel exclusions, that even if you are a regular investor, you, if you're, even if you're a standard fund, you might still be bound by those constraints. And the extent to which this is taken into account in academic research is limited to my knowledge. We look at, do you sign the PRI or do you not sign the PRI? Do you have environmental and social in your actual fund um, name? But is it really the name that matters or the constraints that the fund is imposing on uh, the fund manager or the firm wide policy? So maybe for future research, we want to think about the importance of these constraints. And so that, let me now put on my nerdy theorist hat. And, and this hopefully matters even if you're not a theorist, because this gets us to what is sustainable investing about? So there are many papers, and I'm going to be attacking my own papers when I make this statement, which will say that sustainable investors are ones that maximize alpha times financial returns plus one minus alpha times some x. And that could be externalities, that could be taste, that could be a warm glow feeling. It's something other than financial returns. And that could be true 
if you're an asset owner. So these models are not wrong, and I've written some of these models. They are not wrong, but they apply to asset owners. They don't apply to asset managers necessarily. Because for asset managers, it may well be that your objective function has to be financial return. And the way that we make you a sustainable investor is not by giving you an additional thing in your objective function, which to some fund managers, they thought this would be illegal, but it's to put on some constraints. So what is sustainable investing? It is constrained investing. When you are buying a fund, you are not buying them having a different objective function. You are buying their constraints. And maybe this is a second best solution to the world, right? If we live in a world with fiduciary duty, then the way in which we can get investors to invest sustainably is to put some constraints on them. And maybe for a client who wants to invest in a fund, you can't write a contract saying maximize alpha R plus one minus alpha X, nor can the fund manager say in a credible way on oh, my beliefs on diversity or biodiversity or, or climate change are this. Instead, you just put them as constraints. That's a second best solution that can sometimes lead to unintended consequences, as I highlighted. But maybe this is what sustainable investing is about. And then for future theoretical dire directions, maybe we can have future research of having the investor not being an asset owner, as that's true in my work, but as an asset manager who maximizes financial returns subject to some particular constraints is this actually what sustainable investing is okay so finally we're going to talk about some actions so we looked at the beliefs the objectives the constraints this is how they manifest in the actual behavior that fund managers do so the first is we ask do you overweight poor es so do you underweight brown companies or overweight green companies for any of the following reasons. So basically we're asking, do you take these things into account in your stock selection decision? And again, to me, the answers were not were, were a bit surprising. So the first one was to avoid downside risk. So I thought the main thing that you should care about is returns. We think about investors being mean variance optimizers. But investors in the real world, they might care much more about downside risk, the third moment, than, say, upside risk. Why, if you're a fund manager, you really don't want to underperform your benchmark, you're worried about the downside and not so much the upside. So for traditional investors, um, the most important things were these reasons. They were financial reasons. Here, this is a case in which sustainable investors have different answers from traditional investors. And you might think, well, that's not too surprising. Shouldn't it be the case that sustainable investors give higher numbers than traditional investors? And they do. That's not surprising. Sustainable investors care more about this than traditional investors. But the question is, why do they care? What are the things that really are coming up trumps there? I thought it would be sustainable investors would care more about brownness or greenness to improve the change, the cost of capital, to change the company's actual behavior. But it's not. It's that we had to. It's due to constraints. It's not due to having a different objective. It's not that my objective function has externalities. And I think that by providing capital to these green companies, I'm going to help them expand. It's because we have clients' values. We have our fans' mandate telling us we have to do this. It's because we have firm-wide policy. Again, sustainable investing is constrained investing. Okay, so the next question we asked is, have you ever voted for a shareholder proposal when the proposal was even slightly negative or neutral for firm value? And why? So the first is, if you look at asking them about negative proposals, very few of them will admit ever, ever to have ever voted for even a single proposal that was negative for shareholder value. And indeed, when we first asked this question in beta testing, we didn't have the neutral here because we thought it'd be interesting to show how these shareholder proposals can lead to some investors feeling pressured to do things which are bad for shareholder value. And we were told by our beta testers, you can't just put this because very few people would admit to this. There's going to be a big difference between neutral 
and just even slightly negative. And this is how we specify the wording. And again, this all comes back to fiduciary duty. So the idea that sustainable investors are going to come in, they're going to force companies to cut their energy production if they're a fossil fuel company, sacrifice financial returns in order to save the planet. This is something that many investors think is just unrealistic given concerns about fiduciary duty. And so what we find here is, again, why are we doing this? It's often we're doing this not because it's going to have a positive impact on society, but again, because we had to because of these constraints. What ranks at the bottom here is this universal ownership theory, where there's people who believe that if I'm a universal owner, I can tell the fossil fuel company, stop producing oil and gas. Why? Because I also own a real estate company which is going to be affected by climate change. But this is really difficult. Why? Because you can't tell directors to do something because it's going to affect something else in your portfolio. The fiduciary duties of a director are to their company. It is not to other companies within the investor's portfolio. So just like cartels are illegal, I can't get you to increase your price because it's going to benefit another company in my portfolio. Again, this idea that this can happen because of universal ownership is not something that at least the portfolio managers we asked was believed to be something which is realistic. So we had stock selection. We had voting. And the final thing we have is engagement. And so we asked, do you ever engage to improve a company's ES performance? And what determines whether you do engage? And again, interestingly, this is something where the differences between traditional and sustainable are large, but not as stark as we thought. Even traditional investors thought we would engage why? Because sometimes these things are financially material. And again, highlighting the lack of a stark difference, sustainable and traditional, they are affected by the same thing, how much the issue affects shareholder value. So sustainable investors are not investing because it affects wider society. They're investing because this is something financially material. That, plus the size of the stake in your company, how much benefit you get, is the big driver of engagement. Okay, I've got far, far more results, but I, I'd love to hear the questions. I can see there's an active Q&A, so thank you for that. So let me just go to the conclusion. So what we looked at was we asked both traditional and sustainable investors as to whether they believe environmental and social factors matter. First, their objective is to maximize financial returns, not necessarily a weighted sum, but they still care about environmental and social issues because they believe they are material, and also they might not be priced in or they might be correlated with other stuff that could not be priced in. So this might be why even mainstream investors believe there's ES alpha. But they believe that companies are close to their value maximizing levels. So the idea they're going to come in and tell companies to change their ES policies is not going to be true at large scale. They're facing constraints that affect their portfolios. And it's these constraints that are often causing them to make decisions, not the objectives. They sometimes tilt their companies based on their portfolios and engage companies based on ES performance. But why, ultimately, this is driven by their financial materiality concerns. We also have a lot of differences in beliefs about what's material and about whether ES performance will have return implications. But this does not neatly follow traditional sustainable lines. And often when we see different outcomes, we think that there are different preferences. So this prize-winning paper in the JFE, this was called investor ideology. So why do investors vote in a different way? They have a different ideology. One investor cares only about money. Another investor cares more about saving the dolphin. However, this may not be the case. Maybe it's different beliefs. They are both about financial returns. But maybe one investor thinks that something is material and another investor thinks that something is not. And perhaps future research can allow for differences in beliefs and differences in opinions, which we see in the asset pricing literature, but we don't see so much in corporate finance so far. And finally, there's some cause for pessimism, at least for those who believe that sustainable investing will change the world, because they do care mainly about financial returns not social performance, and they believe that companies are close to maximizing financial value. So the idea that they're going to come in and tell companies to do much more ES is not necessary. OK, 
Great. Well, thank you so much again for uh, the invitation to everybody for attending. And I can already see there's lots of great questions um, which mm -hmm. are in the Q&A. Q so let me just go to um, Cesario to, to uh, try to pick out some of them. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Alex. It was a great presentation. And we are looking forward for the version, the written version of uh, the working paper that you can share with us. So your study really show multiple and interesting um, and surprising at some extent results. So it shows that financial considerations are the primary reason for investment decisions, even uh, among uh, sustainable funds. And the second reason is uh, constraints. O also provide that um, uh, some investor beliefs contradict academic research. So basically, many believe that good ESG or ES in this case performance deliver positive alpha, that carbon emissions reduce returns and that board diversity increase returns. So to clarify, is sustainable investing an investment investing strategy or adds on on the other investing investment strategy, even in the case of sustainable sustainable funds? I think it's a it's an investment style or set of investment constraints. So just like other investment styles, let's say a size style or a growth style or a value style. So you might be a fund saying, okay, we're going to be pursue value investing, and that is done not because you have different preferences. It's not to save value companies but you just believe value companies are going to generate alpha. And I think sustainable investing should be seen, again, as a style. So this is why in my end of ESG paper, I said sustainable investing is, is really just investing. It's no more special than any other styles of investing. And the fact that financial returns seem to be the things that are predominant is consistent with that. And the way in which you do this is you say in your prospectus, we are going to be avoiding particular sectors, just like as a small cap fund, you're going to say we're going to invest only in small cap stocks. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pick up the questions a bit random because there are so many of them. And then we'll share all the questions by the end with, with you. And uh, so we don't have to, to stress. Uh, I have one from Mike Sebastian, uh, which asks, uh, how do respondents distinguish consciously between, say, strategy and competitive position factors and ESG factors? Is the risk of a carbon regulation for a fossil fuel company a strategic competitive factor or uh, an ESG factor? Yeah, thank you very much for, for the question, Mike. So here, this is something that the investors said that it was actually quite difficult to, to rank between them. Um, so even though we thought this might be an easy question to give at the start, there were comments in free text fields that it was difficult to disentangle them. Not so much for the reason that you suggest, which is, is this truly a strategy reason or an ES reason? But all of these things are intertwined with each other. So often, if a company is performing well operationally, it could be due to good ES performance. So they found this sometimes difficult to rank, but they were still able to, to, to do so. But what does this mean in terms of practical implications? I think for research, given these things are difficult to identify, we do need to control for other stuff when trying to look at a link between ES performance and financial returns, because any link could be due to its correlation with all of these other factors. And if we can't control for things because we can't control for corporate culture, then maybe we want to caveat that there's other things which are going on there. But certainly the concern that Mike, uh, Mike shared was something which was expressed by some um, respondents. So even though we did find some stark orderings here, these things can't be ranked completely cleanly because there are blurred lines between them. But I think the lines were not so blurred that we were still able to get some answers and some, some clear rankings. Thank you, Alex. Uh, another question from Andre Poiser. Uh, is there a concern that the items you ask uh, respondents to rank at all endogenous and drive uh, ES performance? Yeah, absolutely. And this is this is a, another great question. And so they're all endogenous because they're all correlated with each other. And so what does this mean? This means a couple of things. So first, you might think it means we always need to use control. Why? Because if ES matters, it could be that ES matters because it's correlated with a lot of other stuff, which ultimately drives performance. But there's also a separate issue here, is that sometimes we, we, we might not want to control for things. 
So that might seem odd. odd. Why might we not want to control something? Because of something known as a bad control. It might be that the reason that ES matters is because it affects the other stuff. So maybe the reason that ES performance affects firm performance is because good ES performance leads to good strategy and competitive vision and good operational performance. And so then what does this mean for us as researchers? We want to show stuff both with controls and without control. Because sometimes the with control specification might be the less accurate specification, because if we're controlling for the ways in which ES performance affects long term value, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice. And maybe then this is a plea for us as referees here, as referees, you often put authors through a lot of pain and tell them control for more and more stuff. Well, we don't want you to control for stuff if that's the channel through which ES performance is going to be doing its magic. Okay, um, we have here, thank you very much, Alex. We have here from Mohak Raitani, it's two questions. Um, uh, one is related with one of your slides, slide 12, that say, did you try to find out other characteristics that cause long-term auto performance? And the second question is, how did you distinguish uh, between uh, traditional investors and sustainable investors? Is it through UN PRI, so United Nations principal responsible? Thank you for the questions. So on, on, the, on, the, on the first one, it was this other stuff. So when people gave mm -hmm. their answers in the free text fields, they were referring to the other stuff which we had in our original question. The reason why ES performance is correlated with other things is it's correlated with all of these things here, which echoes sort of Mike's earlier question that these things are hard to disentangle. In terms of who are traditional and sustainable investors, I apologize for not being clear about this. This is, we asked you, are your, is your fund marketed as a traditional fund or a sustainable fund where we said it's sustainable or responsible or ESG or SRI or ethical. So it's how the fund is marketed. And why is this the best thing to do rather than whether the fund family signs the PRI? Because often you're signing the PRI at an asset manager level, at a fund family level, not at an individual fund level. And so we're wanting to get more granular. We're asking portfolio managers who manage funds not chief investment officers who manage entire asset managers. Thank you, Alex. Um, another question now from Irina Mateus. So should asset managers think more about the long-term performance that may come from institutional demand driven by ESG policies? The demand for ESG stock may lead to long-term value. Could it could be the right time to invest? It's a good question. It's not something that my study um, was, mm -hmm. survey was about, but I'm still happy to answer this as somebody who works in <laughs> sustainable investing. Yes, it could be, because if you're somebody who wants to predict alpha, what you want to predict is you either find, you want something to affect the stock price, and it can affect the stock price because it's financially material that gets priced in. Or it affects the stock price because it's a demand and supply thing. So if you believe that demand for ESG stocks is going to go up over time, even if it's not just to buy by fundamentals, you might want to buy them today. So what is a stock worth? Well, one answer is the present value of future dividends. Another answer is what other people are willing to pay for it. And so let me go back again to this excellent paper, Sustainable Investing in Equilibrium by Pastor Stambo and Taylor, which won the JFE Best Paper Award a few years ago. And so this is a theoretical model of this, the ways in which ESG can lead to returns. You can indeed get this revaluation alpha if investors are coming in and buying these green stocks that's going to push up their stock prices over time. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, another question too from Mike Sebastian. Um, how should asset owners decide between traditional and sustainable strategies? Neither is prioritizing changing company behavior or, or the cost of capital. Yeah, I, 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 this is really good. And, and this is, to us, um, one of the striking things. We thought whether you're a sustainable fund or, or traditional fund, this is the big thing that you can look at. And it really isn't. What you're buying is you're buying the constraints. So you might want to look at what does the actual fund prospect say, prospectors say about their sustainable investing strategy. If it's something like we are going to incorporate ES factors, that is not really constrained, and maybe a mainstream fund will still incorporate ES factors. But if it says we're going to exclude particular stocks or we're going to be voting for shareholder proposals, those are the things that you're going to look for because those are the things which are going to allow people 
example, it's going to allow fund managers to take actions, even if um, these things are not going to be necessarily financially uh, material. You also would need to look at the overall fund families policy. So I fall into this trap myself. I just look at the fund that I'm buying. But the fund that you're buying is not a fund which operates in isolation. It could well be that your, your fund family is saying, OK, we're not allowed to invest in Sudan. And that's something which is going to apply to all funds within that family. OK, thank you. Um, another question. What is driving the constraints? Are they a response to wider cultural change around the ES issues? Yeah, thanks, Andre, for the question. We don't really know because, because we just ask do constraints cause you to do this um another thing is 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 why um why do these constraints exist in the first place so let me answer that in two ways first let me answer this by giving props to um another paper so there's this paper in the journal of financial economics by um these guys here um which um it's called why constrain your fund manager. So they ask, well, why do we have constraints to begin with? Why do we have such a thing as a healthcare fund? Why don't we just give the fund manager money and say, invest wherever you think is going to generate alpha? Why do we need to tell you you should invest in healthcare? Because isn't this the fund manager's expertise? And so it might be that sometimes asset owners think that they know more than asset managers and they might want to impose constraints by saying, we believe that um fossil fuels are always going to be bad because we believe there's going to be a strong carbon tax. But this is also something that we might ourselves explore because why one of the reasons why the study is not yet publicly available is there's one thing we still haven't done. Well, a few things we haven't done. One of them was we need to show statistical significance, which somebody um, has asked us about. We just need to calculate all of those things. But another thing is that after you conduct the survey, one final thing you do is you interview people in order to find, ask, why is it that you gave the responses that you want to? So why is it that you're putting these constraints on yourself, even though this means that you're going to have to sacrifice financial value and social value? And because we have 509 people responding, we're currently going through the process of picking out, out of these people, who are the ones who we really want to interview because they gave interesting responses and responses that we didn't fully understand. So this is why I'm afraid the paper might still be like two or three months off public um, circulation, because it might take us a month to conduct the interviews and then a month or two to write it up. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And I think that we are getting to one of the last questions, because already close to five o'clock. So do, do, do and, and you need to take a brief, you know, because there's been so many questions. Uh, do you think the reason you have such results since the subject pool is fund manager who are responsible, accountable, for other clients. Therefore, they need to focus on the financial return to maintain their income and reputation. Individual investors may have different uh, preferences. Do you think that the results might be driven for, for this? I think is what is arguing, uh, Kim, uh, with this uh, uh, question. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point, Kim. And so, uh, again, let me answer this by by giving some props to another paper. So we have this paper by Stefano Giglio et al., which looks at individual retail investors who are maximizing their own objective rather than being delegated asset managers. But we think that it's still interesting to look at fund managers as we do, because the vast majority of money is run by these professional fund managers, not by these retail investors. They're not going to come up and and ask for a meeting with the CEO and tell them you need to cut your carbon footprint. So like it or lump it, the way in which sustainable investing will have an impact is going to be predominantly through asset managers, not mum and pop investors or, or professors like me who hold a little bit of stock, but through the as asset managers. And for too long, people, and again, I fall in this bucket. So everything I'm saying here, I'm saying as much to myself, people will model these investors like this, but that would be true for individual investors, as you say, Kim, but not necessarily true for asset managers. So again, what we're wanting to do is to open up a new dimension of academic research is to take seriously the people who are doing these things are managing other people's money, not their own money. And this has important implications for how effective they will be in, in changing the world. Th thank you, Alex. Uh, if you allow me a last question, <laughs> just to, to finalize. Um, in terms of the regulations of ESG ratings, and um, what is your opinion? 
about um, recently in the, on the Council and the European Parliament, uh, I believe it was last February, proposal for a regulation on ESG rating activity, which aims to boost investor confidence in sustainable products. Uh, do you think that will be successful, this regulation in ESG ratings and how much they can interfere in terms of the, the investor's position on their decisions? If it will be more reliable, if you can say this way, these ESG ratings are more comparable. Yeah, so, so thank you for, for this. And I know that people... Um believe that regulation is always going to be a solution but but i don't see how you can regulate ratings ratings are opinions so this is a provider's opinion as to whether a company is environmental or, or socially well performing and different people have different opinions and again let me finally uh, again answer this by giving props to another paper this is an extremely successful paper in the review of finance just looking at the source of the disagreement and so part of this is, is measurement how do we measure something if we want to care about how female friendly a company is do we look at the number of women on the board the number of women in the workforce the gender pay gap there could be differences of opinion as to what is the relevant way to measure this. And can a regulator be the supreme being saying, I know the one way to measure this really complicated thing? No, because we want diversity. We want a difference of opinion. I like the fact that different um, investors, different rating agencies will disagree with each other. This is why, as an editor, sometimes I ask for two referee reports. Sometimes those referee reports will disagree with each other. It's not that one person is wrong. It's just they have differences of opinion. And so... I understand in many cases we want to have standardization and harmonization, but if this leads there just to being one particular answer, I think we're going to have a, a, a actually much less rich conversations on a topic which is nuanced, and because it's nuanced, we want to listen to different opinions. And so while I think this regulation will work in many cases, I'm very for a carbon tax. I've been very pro that since my first book, Grow the Pie. I think regulation, which suggests there is only one answer for whether a company is green or brown, I think that is something which could be quite problematic. Thank you very much. We passed the five o'clock and uh, we have been very pleased and glad to have you with us, Professor Edmonds. Um, uh, Michelle was able to join us. Do you want to say some words uh, on behalf of Financial Management International? Um, sure. Thank you, Cesario. Thank you, Professor Edmonds. I'm sorry for being tardy to today's seminar. I'm juggling multiple meetings today, uh, but I'm very glad that I was able to catch what I was able to catch here. Um, very interesting survey. I'm looking forward to um, reviewing the recording of this um, of this seminar, and I appreciate that. Um, Alex, if we may, uh, we have kind of one logistical question that came through um, that I'm hoping you can answer. Um, somebody asked if the survey will be freely available with the responses um, rather than the summary statistics after this. The answer is unfortunately no, because we guaranteed anonymity. So we guaranteed that when we would um, ask people for the survey, we would we would not um, give individual responses. Uh, and this is just to encourage people to, to respond truthfully. Um, so I'm afraid I understand why you asked that question. The granular data could be interesting, but we do have to honour what we what we promised them. And obviously you wouldn't know that we promised them this. So it's a very legitimate question. But unfortunately, we have to give the summary statistics only. Yeah, and that that's a great answer, um, and I, I think I think a good practice um, for that particular survey. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're over time, so I just want to um, thank you again for your for your excellent um, presentation today, and as always, your very thought provoking research. Um, so, on behalf of FMA and Feb RN, um, I want to thank you all for joining us here today, um, and I want to invite you for our next seminar, which will be our final seminar of spring of twenty twenty four. That's with um, Professor David Hirschleifer on the 30th of May. Um, so please keep an eye out on our website for that. Um, so um, if nothing else is serio, um, I would just like yes. to thank everybody on behalf of you, me, FebRN, um, FMA. Thank you, Professor Edmonds, as always, for your excellent, um, excellent thoughts um, and for entertaining all of our questions.